Good afternoon, and thank you for being here again today and for your continued coverage. Today I'm joined by Tony Robinson, who is the FEMA Region 6 Administrator, General Keith Waddell with Louisiana National Guard, Secretary Marquita Walters of the Department of Children and Family Services, Secretary Dr. Sean Wilson of the Department of Transportation and Development, and also with us is Steve Russo with the Department of Health. All of these individuals will deliver prepared remarks after mine, and then I will come back up uh, and close out and then take your questions. Obviously, over the past week, uh, all of you all have heard me relay a lot of numbers regarding response progress and ways to access aid that's currently available. Um, these are the folks who can speak directly to those efforts uh, with their respective agencies, and that's why I've asked them to deliver updates. I've traveled now to 13 parishes that had severe impacts from Hurricane Ida. Uh, we did that over the past week, uh, and I can tell you that we obviously have an awful lot of work to do to get people right side up again. I can also tell you, however, I'm very proud of the team effort that has been made. Uh, and when I say team, I'm not talking about just the team here at the state level. I'm talking about all of the Paris Offices of Emergency Preparedness, the sheriffs, the parish presidents, the EOC directors, uh, I'm sorry, OEP directors, and, and our federal partners as well. Uh, but this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, as we gather today, we still have five parishes that have more than 95% of their power out. I believe that's St. John, St. Charles, St. James, Terrebonne, and Lafouche. So while we've seen lots of improvement, a lot of really good work in terms of power and water and in terms of uh, cell phone coverage and so forth, there's an awful lot of work to be done. Uh, with respect to power outages, the last number I saw is we're down to 435,000 uh, customers. That means homes and businesses without power. Uh, that's a lot but it's down from 1.1 million in the immediate aftermath of the storm. And in order to help with restoration and other things, I uh, signed a proclamation yesterday in an effort to assist hotels across the state in housing first responders, essential health care employees, and utility workers who are restoring critical infrastructure in the state so that their rooms are protected, so that they get to stay in their rooms rather than being put out so that those hotels have to honor many reservations that they had taken uh, previous to the storm. Our number one priority right now is recovering from the storm. Obviously, we can't do that if the first responders and critical workers don't have a place to stay. And they have graciously come here, literally from all over the country. And we want to work with them uh, to make sure that they have a place to stay that is safe uh, and comfortable so that they can do their best work to restore power and to deliver the services and the goods that are necessary to assist all of the Louisianans in need today. And so I would further that with, with saying that if you are planning to come to Louisiana for reasons unrelated to hurricane response, at least, please check with your hotel before traveling to make sure that your room is not being used to critical, used to house critical emergency workforce personnel. A brief weather update. The system that we've all been watching and that I have mentioned previously uh, is not a threat to Louisiana. I think we've seen a little rain from it. Uh, it has about a 40 to 60 percent chance of development, uh, but those areas that will feel any impacts from this storm system, 91L, uh, will be further to our east. We are expecting an additional rain today and maybe overnight, uh, and oddly enough, a continued heat advisory as well. Uh, and the heat advisory is largely limited to those individuals who don't have power. They don't have the air conditioning to go in and cool themselves off. There is a front headed our way later this week that is expected to bring some relief from the heat uh, and the humidity and the rain, and that will be very welcome when it gets here. And that will be especially true in the early morning hours when the temperatures could be in the low 60s, at least north of the lake. 
State offices will be closed tomorrow in the following parishes. Assumption, East Feliciana, Jefferson, Lafouche, Livingston, Orleans, Plaquemines, St. Bernard, St. Charles, St. Helena, St. James, St. John the Baptist, St. Tammany, Tanshbaho, and Terrebonne. Ascension is the only parish with state office closures today that will be open tomorrow. Of the parishes that I just mentioned, I can further say that the following 11 will remain closed through Friday, September the 10th. They include Jefferson, Lafouche, Plaquemines, St. Bernard, St. Charles, St. Helena, St. James, St. John the Baptist, St. Tammany, Tanshbaho, and Terrebonne. I was informed this morning at the UCG that more than 17,000 disaster unemployment claims have been filed related to Hurricane Ida. Uh, the best way for people to file their claim if they are able to do so is to file online by visiting www.laworks.net using the LWC Hire Portal. If you don't have access to the internet, you can also file a claim through the UI Claim Center by calling 866-783-5567. Although the, the storm came and went this past Sunday, CB, CPRA has continuing dewater dewatering operations uh, in Lafitte, Plaquemines, and St. Bernard. They're also moving additional plumps to Terrebonne Parish to help remove flood waters uh, in Point of Shen and in Chauvin. And they're sending additional pumps also to Lafitte today to speed up the process of flood water removal. Weather permitting, the Corps of Engineers will begin their first blue roof installations tomorrow. Uh, as of now, over 40,000 homes in Louisiana have signed up for this program. Residents can sign up for the program at blueroof.us. That's online at blueroof.us. You can also call toll free 1 888 Roof Blue. There's no E on the end of blue. And that number is 1 888 766 3258. Unfortunately, I have two more storm related deaths to report today, both coming out of St. Tammany. The coroner confirmed the death of a 68-year-old male who fell off a roof while making repairs uh, to his home caused by Hurricane Idle, and then the death of a 71-year-old male who died of lack of oxygen during an extended power outage. This brings to 15, the total number of confirmed storm-related deaths to this event. We also learned today that FEMA has approved public assistance permanent work for categories C through G for the following seven parishes. Jefferson, Lafouche, Orleans, St. Charles, St. James, St. John, and Terrebonne. We don't believe this will be a final list of parishes uh, that are eligible to receive these categories of assistance, this permanent work, uh, but the damage assessments are not complete. Uh, and we anticipate uh, making a request for additional parishes to be added for category C through G uh, in the coming days. Uh, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Tony Robinson, who is the FEMA Region 6 Administrator. Uh, he comes out of Denton, Texas, and he has been here on the ground with us in Baton Rouge since before the storm uh, made landfall. And then he will be followed by General Keith Waddell, Secretary Marquita Walters, Dr. Sean Wilson, and Steve Russo uh, in that order. And then I will come back up. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. And I just want to thank you and Director Roscom and certainly your leadership team for, for the great job that they've done and, and the work that they continue to do to serve the citizens of Louisiana. Um, your leadership has enabled us to mobilize federal resources to support the, the uh, state of Louisiana. I also want to thank 
uh, the first responders, the parish leadership, all disasters start and end locally, and certainly some heroic efforts out there on the part of our parish officials. I've also traveled with the governor. I've been out to the impacted areas, and I've seen the extensive damage that's out there, and it is significant. We understand that recovery is a stressful time for individuals, and it's going to take longer than some would expect. But we need you to know that the, the men and women of FEMA are focused make, to making the widest range of assistance available to those who need it most. The most important thing that you can remember is the first step. If you have insurance, apply with your insurance and then call FEMA 800 621 3362 to apply for assistance, or you can go online to disasterassistance.gov, or you can use our mobile app, the FEMA app. A couple of things that we'd ask once you register is please stay in touch with us once you've applied. Follow up on your case. Keep your information up to date. If you move, if you have a change in phone number, those things are vitally important to us to be able to maintain that contact with you. And probably most importantly is ensure any required documentation is, is that we've asked for you is provided to us, especially in the case of insurance settlements, especially if you are denied for any type of insurance assistance. If you, have insure, if you have insurance and you've not filed a claim with your insurance company, please do so and then provide us with a copy of your insurance settlement, whether that's an approval or denial. In the interim, you may receive a notification from us that says there is no decision. That does not mean that you've been denied. That just means we need that additional documentation for us to be able to make the determination on the types of assistance you may be available for. Survivors that are applying and receiving assistance to date have received more than $175 million from FEMA through our individual assistance program. And we also have survivors taking advantage of our transitional sheltering assistance with more than 8,800 8, 8, households checked into hotels. And that's uh, including more than 25,000 household members sheltered in that program. We have disaster survivor assistance teams working in 14 parishes today. Those are teams that will go out in the communities, go door to door, go to where there's points of distribution. They will help you register, provide you information about the types of assistance that FEMA has available. And we'll continue to grow that program uh, as we get people in the area. FEMA has also paid National Flood Insurance Program policyholders over $4 million in claims resulting from Hurricane Ida, and we expect those numbers to continue to grow. Our partners at the Small Business Administration have approved 222 loans for a to total of more than $8.3 million. As the governor said, we're partnered with the United States Army Corps of Engineers to launch the Blue Roof program, and to date we've had over 42,000 people who have registered for that program. And we continue to provide commodities to the Louisiana National Guard, who's been a great partner in supporting those points of distribution. We also have partners with the United States Department of Health and Human Services. They've deployed over 180 medical providers and other staff from the National Disaster Medical System to support triage and treatment of patients in Louisiana. And then our Corps of Engineer partners continue to work with GOSIP and the Louisiana National Guard to assist in installing generators and doing assessment from generators. I'd like you to know that FEMA will have a long-term presence here. John Long will be the federal coordinating officer. He is a resident of Louisiana, and he will be here for the duration of this response. FEMA has been here before Ida made landfall, and we're not going anywhere. We're here to make sure we work side by side with our state and local partners to help you in your recovery efforts. This time, I'd like to turn it over to General Keith Waddell. Governor Edwards. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to start off by saying my heart goes out to everybody that's been impacted by Hurricane Ida. And I would like to thank the citizens that we've had the opportunity to interact with thus far, as well as our local, state, and federal partners who we've had an opportunity to collaborate with and coordinate with as we've achieved unity and effort in taking care or dealing with Hurricane Ida. Our current uh, overall strength is nearing 8,900 service members, and of that 8,900 service members, I would share that fi nearly 5,300 of those are Louisiana National Guardsmen and women. That represents 100 percent 
of all the men and women that are in Louisiana National Guard in the state right now. And we do have, I'd remind everybody, we have 2,400 Guard men and women that are overseas right now in the Middle East and on the Southwest border. Additionally, we've got 3,100 plus that have come from 14 other states to support us. Many of these states are local, are close to us, but we have had soldiers come from as far as Alaska to support our operations here in Louisiana. And on the active duty side, uh, with our soldiers, airmen, Marines, and sailors, we're at 470 plus, and those individuals have come from Fort Polk, our own Fort Polk, Fort Hood, McDill Air Force Base in Florida, and Gulfport, Mississippi. All these service members are working approximately 179 missions, and they're doing that in 28 different parishes. We're focused on seven lines of effort. Those lines of effort include commodities distribution, engineering, security, power generation, medical, COVID, and parish governmental support. So what I'll do next is kind of briefly go through each one of those and give you the highlights of what's going on with those major lines of effort. So for us, our main effort is with commodities distribution. Right now, we have 71 total sites. 67 of those are points of distribution and four of those are hubs, where they actually do hub and spoke operations into smaller communities within the respective parishes. Those operations are taking place in 15 different parishes, namely in southeast Louisiana. So I would like to share with you, if I could draw your attention to the board, the statistical information as far as distribution and what's happened up to this point. If you would like to keep track of this on a day-by-day -day basis, you can go, go to GoGuard LA. Dot gov and that go is G-E-A-U-X. And we update that each and every day so you can see the amount of commodities that are being distributed to the citizens and the visitors to our state. I would add that we do have bulk water assets that are out right now, about a total of 51 of those, and they have supported local, local parishes with tens of thousands of gallons of potable water to the citizens that are in their particular areas. Engineer operations, you can look at the infographic that's posted and you can see the amount of roads that we've assessed or the miles of roads that we've assessed and cleared up to this point. I would tell you we've also removed over 1,910 cubic yards of debris and those numbers will continue to grow as we shift from working on primary and secondary roads and we start working on municipal facilities. We've been placed over 100, well, we've been placed 182 super sacks, excuse me, in two different parishes, those being St. Charles and Plaquemines Parish. And if we can go to the next slide, I would like to show you what we've done in Lafitte. So what we've done here, we had a bridge that was inoperative. We worked with uh, DOTD. We came up with a solution. This floating bridge, what we call improved ribbon bridge, and we've actually spanned the channel there. And if you look on both ends, you can see ramp bays, what we call ramp bays. And in the middle are our interior bridge bays. And we've basically connected this system together, which will allow uh, the citizens to go to the other side. And currently that plan is to leave that bridge in place for two months. So we're very proud of this particular effort. And I think our citizens are going to greatly benefit from it. With generators, we're proactively involved, working with GOSEP and the Corps of Engineers on getting generators out to the parishes that are requesting them. Right now, we have 149 generators that are currently on mission. On the medical side, we have three teams that are currently working. We have one team of 31 working at the Morial Convention Center, uh, providing patient care and telemed. We have another team at the Terrebonne General Hospital who's working in the emergency department there. And we have a smaller team in West Jeff doing patient care. With security, we have over 680 guardsmen working in 15 different parishes, assisting law enforcement with roving and static security. And we take our cues, because we're supporting civilian authority, we work with local law enforcement on whether they need us to do presence, excuse me, presence patrols, work at traffic control points, or if it's any other sort of security. 
Uh, governmental support, we have liaisons that work closely with the parish leaderships. So we talk to them about our portfolio and all the capabilities that we have within the Louisiana National Guard and the other services that are with us. We make recommendations and based upon those recommendations, we may or may not execute the mission. A good example of that is the ribbon bridge that you see up on the, on the board. Uh, that was a recommendation that our team came up with, th thankfully between the parish, the city and DOTD, they were okay with us executing that mission. On the COVID side, we've been doing this for quite some time. Our numbers were down in terms of testing sites and vaccination sites, but we've increased those numbers. Today we're at 29 testing sites, 15 vaccination sites, and we continue to work in food banks, of which we're in seven today. In closing, I, I want to remind you once again, we do have uh, 2,400 of our guardsmen that have deployed overseas. I think about them each and every night and their families and they're doing remarkable work overseas and you can be very proud of what those men and women are doing there. I would also like to thank all the men and women of the Louisiana National Guard, the other states National Guards and thanks to those adjutant generals in those particular states and the governors for allowing them to come here to help us and our active duty teammates that are supporting Louisiana for Hurricane Ida operations. What, without them, our families, our employers, and our civilian employees, we would not have been as ex successful as we have up to this point. I know we have a long way to go, but I'm very confident in the team that we have, the local, state, and federal partners that we're working with, and all the citizens that we interact with, that we will get on the other side of this in due time. I'll hold if you have any questions for me at the end but I'll be followed by Secretary Walters with DCFS. Thank you, General, and thank you, Governor. DCFS is responsible for a couple of things during a disaster. We are responsible for the mass sheltering and feeding of our population. But even before that, we are more responsible for the children and youth that are in the custody of the state in the foster care system. So the very first thing we do when there is an approaching storm is reach out to every foster parent, every foster family in the state and check in with them to make sure we know that they are following their evacuation plan that they have pre-filed with us when they first became foster parents. And then we continue checking with them until we know every single foster child is safe in this state. And it does significant credit to our governor that he asks about that and wants to know that those children are safe. So thank you, Governor, for that. We um, started a foster parent support line that is up and running 24-7, so foster parents can reach out to that. And we also have 65,000 children in the state that live with family members or fictive kin, and these children are not in the foster care system, but they would be if these family members didn't step up for their care. So we have a kinship line that is dedicated just to that staff, and for and these families are so critical for us. They keep children connected to their own family, their own history, their own culture, and they don't have to come into the state system. The kinship line number is, you can text to um, kinship LA at 898-211 or just call 211 for all the information on that line. And then when we think about the sheltering work that we do, we don't do this in isolation. All the members of the team that you see standing in these press conferences, it takes DOT buses to bring people to the shelters. It takes Lang and the, and the state troopers to have security there. It takes food vendors to help us feed. It takes the um, Department of Education to do respite care and dietary care. It takes the Department of Health to have their docs and their nurses there to, to do the medical care. We work with agriculture on the pets because, you know, if you don't leave with your pet, you're probably not going to leave. We work with the VOADs for all the donations that people are so generous and want to give and want to help. 
And critically, we work with Red Cross and with 211 and the local OEP directors that make sure that these people are in safe and stable places. Right now, as 11 o'clock today, we have 3,180 people in the shelters. That's about 23 shelters across the state that include local shelters, Red Cross shelters, and the state-operated shelters. The shelter numbers are moving constantly as people are coming in and out of the shelters. Our local OEPs are doing great jobs at opening shelters to bring their people home. And so the shelter numbers surge a little and then go back a little because as those local shelters come up, we want those residents to go home so that they can be closer to their homes and their schools. If you have any questions about sheltering, the easiest thing to do is text 211. You can text LA Shelter to 898-211 or you can just call 211. We also have an evacuee connect line because we know that many people aren't quite sure where their loved ones are. And so we set up a line that you can call in and we can't tell you where they are, but we will take the information, we will make the contact in the shelter, and then we will help that person in the shelter be able to reach out and call you. That line operates from 7 in the morning till 7 at night, and I think the number is up there on the screen for you to see that. Now the food assistance. There's a lot of concern and confusion about the food programs that we run, so I'm going to talk about them in two different buckets. First, there is the regular SNAP program, what we know as food stamps, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. For the most highly affected parishes, those 18 parishes that we have talked about so often, if those parishes were out of power for 24 hours and 55% of the parish was without power, then we got automatic benefits to replace those SNAP benefits so those SNAP recipients don't have to do anything. Those benefits automatically get loaded on their card. Now, if you were in, a, in one of the other parishes, not in that core 18, you can still apply if you were without power for 24 hours, which we know so many of our residents were. And there is a form that you have to fill out to do that, but that's on our website. And um, I think that number is also up there. The, there are right now about um, 200,000 SNAP households that have already um, been designated to get these um, mass replacements. That's about 413,000 people in our state and over $47 million in SNAP dollars coming into the economy. And this is so important at a time when our economy is stressed because of the storm. This is going to put $73 million straight into those 18 parishes. Then DSNAP. Everybody knows about DSNAP and we are well versed in doing DSNAP in Louisiana and people know about it and they're excited about it and they want to get it as soon as they can. So here's what happens in disaster food. It's a sequence. The pods that the general talked about, those very first points of distribution where they're giving ice and water, that's the beginning of food assistance to our affected areas. And then the bulk household things that you can get from your food banks, all of that is coming from our same food partners at the, um, the FNS and Food and Nutrition Services and the Department of Agriculture. And it's staggered this way for a reason. You can't do DSNAP immediately because there's no grocery store. There's no power. There's no phone. There's no technology. People have to be able to call in to get their DSNAP cards. And so it's staged for a reason. We will begin DSNAP operations and do them in three phases. The exciting thing about DSNAP for the state of Louisiana now is that last year, for the first time during COVID, Louisiana pioneered the virtual process. You don't need anything but a telephone to get your DSNAP cards. You call in, we run the um, DSNAP totally virtually, 
and then we do have to mail you your card so there also has to be in that parish there has to be a way for us to get mail to you because you're not coming and standing in line and being handed a card right at the end so there's a process in place and it takes time for all of those reasons dsnap is coming it just will come at the appropriate time to pre-register will help you get your benefits faster you don't have to but it'll make it easier if you do it quickly and for that again 211 one of the best partners in the state you can text LAD snap to 898 211 and all of this information is on our website if you have any questions about am I eligible how do I know is it going to be in my parish when's it going to be in my parish then you can look on our website um, which is also up there on the board and get the information you need there if you have LA wallet that is also a fast track to getting your DSNAP benefits so there's we know there's confusion we know it's a little different it's not like we used to do it in the old days when we had big box stores and took up all the guard and the state police and everybody else's time and energy now we can do it virtually and it's so much easier and nicer because you can call from wherever you are if you've evacuated and you have a phone you can just call and register so um, we want everybody to do that we want them to pre-register because we do want to get food into all of our citizens hands Thank you, and I will be Sean. I will be Sean. I'm going to be followed by Sean Wilson. It would be hard for me to be Sean, but there you go. Thank you, Secretary Walters. Um, and to echo what Tony said regarding the governor's leadership, uh, we support that and agree with that, but also want to acknowledge, as Marquita laid out, all of the different cabinet officials that participate in various stages of this disaster and that's an amazing group to work with and we'll demonstrate that in a second first uh, if you follow 511la.org which is where we would encourage all citizens to learn about traffic and conditions of the road we're now tracking 13 closures across the entire state of Louisiana that were related to Ida Initially, uh, when the event occurred, we evacuated close to 700 plus thousand people, we estimate, in 24 hours safely uh, with no deaths or major disturbances or occurrences other than congestion. But we immediately began preparing for the aftermath. And in that aftermath, we have cleared over 4,200 miles of road, which was being pushed and shoved, basically taking immediate debris and pushing it to the side to make things passable for first responders and emergency vehicles. That is effectively the beginning of our debris operation. Thus far on a debris operation, we have cleared over 350 shoulder miles of road that has been cleared of all debris related to Ida. Um, and that includes elevated structures that we know are not going to have other debris brought to them. A total that gives us about a 15,000 cubic yards of debris that's been removed in the last two days as we just started moving that process up. Up on the screen, you see some do's and don'ts about debris because if it's anything like Laura and Delta, we will be six months, if not longer, in this process of removing debris. And there's some how-to things that you as the general public need to do in terms of sorting debris and moving it out. And I know that's difficult for folks in the middle of a disaster to think about sifting through all of those hard things to deal with. But in reality, it expedites the process. We have over 50 crews in the state of Louisiana within just the first two days. And that, of course, will ramp up, exceeding, based on our estimates of what we did in Laura, and 42 bucket trucks. That's going to help thin out a number of the leaning and hanging branches and trees that you see. Going to 511LA.org, you have an opportunity to hit the debris dashboard. That's essential for parishes because it will allow you to see where we're passing what amount of debris we've collected, when is your community perhaps going to be on the radar, but most importantly, that we've done a first pass and a second pass and a third pass. As a result of that, this is going to address all of the state routes that you might see debris and other items on that system. It's updated daily at 6 a.m., and so it should be current. Uh, it went live yesterday after the first day of pickup on Saturday. Regarding bridge inspections, we have 1,339 total bridges that have been expected to date. 
That's 93% of the 1,400 plus bridges in the impacted area. That's significant because you can have a great road with a bridge that's out and you will not be able to travel. And it's incumbent upon us as lead safety agency to ensure that those bridges are passable and safe, particularly for first responders and folks still helping to clean up communities and bring them back to life. Regarding our movable bridges, 38% of the 42 movable bridges that have been impacted are open to vehicle traffic and marine traffic, but 92% of them are open especially to vehicular traffic to date. So that's a very important factor. A number of our bridges get lifted up with surge and they may not seat properly and so that requires some effort in addition to a number of the electrical units going underwater. And then signals, a very important part of safety and reconstituting communities. 30% of the signals that are 1,418 signals in the impacted area, 30% of them are still damaged. 70% of them are functioning and have been reconstituted since the storm and or are running on generator power and waiting on additional power through Entergy and other energy providers. Regarding our ESF-1 function, that has to do with evacuation and moving people out, we have over 209 buses on hand today, uh, 185 coaches and 24 paratransits that have been involved in a number of moves pre-storm and after the storm, not just for our citizens, but also for our federal partners. To date, we have moved over 3,800 individuals as well as 88 pets. And just yesterday, we moved 221. A big part of that has to do with uh, bringing folks back to their communities when the parish governments are ready to receive them. In regards to ESF-3, which is our engineering function, we've partnered with National Guard and all of our agencies, whether it's DCFS or LDH, with signs, signals, and other engineering support services to make those processes convenient, safe, and efficient. And then we have some high-level projects I'd like to update you on in terms of what we've been able to do. Emergency repairs on LA-1 have been completed. Uh, we have completed uh, the initial push as a result of those temporary repairs. Uh, we're excited about the temporary bridge that the National Guard worked with a number of partners to install. The department is accelerating the construction of the final permanent replacement of that bridge with all of our federal partners. Uh, we do expect to have an acro panel bridge up that will not be load posted. Uh, within the eight week window, we're trying to accelerate that even more. And then the department has also instituted a pedestrian ferry uh, that will run until we see a need for it is no longer there in the Barataria area. And then on LA-23, we're continuing to deal with water and are working with local law enforcement and parish leaders to provide pilot transportation for folks southbound. And then last but not least, with regards to the LA-1 uh, toll facility, uh, tolls have still been suspended or continue to be suspended. Uh, we do not anticipate uh, cash collections to come back up within the next month and a half to two months. Uh, we do expect to see electronic collections proceed uh, in a time shorter than that. And then my last statement in regards to preparing for future events, because the governor has been very keen on making sure we're prepared. Uh, we have started a number of efforts to clean culverts, drains and box culverts in the impacted area to ensure that there are no residual debris left in the system uh, should we have an unfortunate circumstance of another storm event. And that's going to occur uh, for the initial uh, remaining portion of our response to this. And subject to your questions following the governor's remarks, uh, we'll be here. And then I'll be followed by uh, our executive counsel from LDH, uh, Stephen Russo. Thank you, Secretary Wilson. Thank you, Governor. Today, the Louisiana Department has issued license revocation notices to the seven nursing facilities that evacuated to the Calhoun Street site in Tangipahoa Parish due to Hurricane Ida. LGH has also moved to terminate the provider agreements from Medicaid with immediate effect. It is the opinion of LDH that all seven facilities have failed to properly execute post-landfall emergency preparedness plans to provide essential care and services to their residents. Further, when LDH was making efforts to fully discover the site conditions post-landfall, LDH surveyors and inspectors, instead of being provided necessary information, were prohibited by the facilities and their owner from conducting and completing on-site inspections and surveys. LDH employees involved in ascertaining the safety 
and the welfare of residents were also subject to intimidation by an individual representing himself as a nursing home owner and providing false and or conflicting information at this time of crisis. Let's be clear, there is no emergency preparedness plan that allows for residents to be kept in such an unsafe, unsanitary, and unhealthy condition. The lack of adequate care for these residents is inhumane and goes against the rules, regulations, and applicable statutes. LDH did move to rescue the residents to ensure that they received the proper care and services that they deserved. We did this by removing them from this site and working to transition them to licensed beds and licensed and certified nursing facilities that are continued uh, to be in operation. This investigation next steps will now continue to be done again in a very deliberate manner where LDH, along with our Office of Public Health and our Health Standards Section, Office of the State Fire Marshal, and our other partners in government will look at pre-landfall planning and preparedness. We will then turn and we will look at post-landfall, uh, post-evacuation, and post-transition uh, to see whether or not the facts in those two areas would lead to additional supplementation of the revocations. LDH made appropriate referrals after discovery of the situation to the Attorney General, to State Police, to the Office of Inspector General, the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office, Baton Rouge City Police, and the Regional Office of Federal HHS in Dallas. This is an ongoing legal matter, so the LDH team is not going to be getting into speaking into the ins and outs of the investigation. However, we do understand that the public needs and expects transparency. However, we need to balance that with the fact that we do not want to do anything that will place in danger the process of gearing up to present our case. I want to go ahead and clarify for you all the seven names of the nursing homes and their location. South Lafouche Nursing and Rehab in Lafouche Parish, River Palms Nursing and Rehab, Mason Orleans Healthcare Center in Orleans Parish, Park Place Healthcare Nursing Center, West Jefferson Healthcare Center, Mason DeVille Home of Harvey, all three in Jefferson Parish, and finally Mason DeVille Nursing Home in Terrebonne. I know there was some issues about whether uh, there was nine homes that were potentially owned by uh, the owner, Mr. Bob Dean. To the best of our knowledge, these are the final seven homes within Louisiana that are owned by Mr. Dean. Governor, with that, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Steve. And before I open it up for questions, I did want to finish up today with a COVID update. Uh, today, Louisiana has surpassed 700,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases since the start of the pandemic. Specifically, we added today 5,532 new COVID cases since last Friday. Hospitalizations due to COVID have trended downward. We're very thankful of that. They're now at 2,003. Obviously, the concern is that that number will continue to, will again go up if, in fact, transmission and cases go up. Um, and that could happen as a result of all of the activities related to the response to Hurricane Ida, especially with various people moving in together and being in close proximity indoors for periods of time. Very sadly, we reported another 72 COVID deaths in Louisiana today. Uh, obviously tragic and sad. Uh, thus far, uh, the total number of Louisianans lost to COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic is 12,779. And there's been a lot of focus on the storm and the deaths associated with it, and there should be. Uh, that number is 15. In the same time, since we've been talking about deaths in Hurricane Ida, we've had another 420 deaths related to COVID. And I say just, just to remind everybody 
We are very much in a pandemic. We are very much in the fourth surge, and there's an awful lot that we can do to control transmission, to reduce transmission. First of all, get vaccinated. Secondly, do those things that we know work, like wear your mask when you're indoors and in close proximity to others, wash your hands, physical distancing, and so forth. So I think this is a huge reality check for all of us. We cannot just be simply focused on our response to and recovery from Hurricane Ida right now. We've got to understand that all this is happening. And in fact, everything that is happening in the state of Louisiana is happening during a pandemic. And it's made harder because we know that Hurricane Ida has disrupted testing. It has displaced people. Uh, and we strongly believe that right now the cases are underreported because of that. We now have community-based COVID test sites in all regions. Uh, we've resumed community-based vaccination sites in all regions except for Region 1, uh, which is New Orleans uh, area, uh, Region 3, which is South Central area, Region 7, Bossier, Shreveport, and Region 9 on the North Shore. Now, to be sure, uh, there are vaccinations available in those areas. Uh, they're just not uh, being administered at presently uh, by some of the people who were ministering before. Uh, but if you call your health care provider, if you go to the hospital, you can receive uh, vaccinations. With all of that, uh, well, let me say this. We're going to aim for Thursday uh, for our next press conference. We'll let you know for sure if we're going to be able to do one that day, and if so, what time. And with that, I'll take your questions in your free to direct your questions either to me or to any of the individuals who have briefed you this afternoon. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, I have to tell you, I, I haven't seen what specific criteria uh, they are referencing. I know that at the outset we were told uh, that the Corps of Engineers, which had been tasked by FEMA to run the program, uh, would deliver the program in those parishes that it knew had uh, were subject to hurricane force winds. Um, and they came up with an initial list. Uh, since that time, it's my understanding they have added two additional parishes, those being St. Helena and Assumption, uh, because they did uh, an assessment in those parishes. They went back and looked at the weather reports as well, and they also know now that there were hurricane force winds in at least portions of those parishes where there was obvious need for the Blue Roof Program, and so those parishes were added. It is further my understanding that assessments continue uh, in additional parishes. Uh, and so I cannot tell you that I have a concern today uh, that may change once, once I know whether additional parishes uh, have been added. But I do want to put another plug in for the Blue Roof Program. An awful lot of people uh, are obviously uh, eligible for this program. It is completely free. It will be a professionally installed Blue Roof. Minor repairs uh, to the roof can happen first. Uh, and then they'll put the blue roof on top, uh, and then they will strap it down uh, in, in ways that, that will allow that roof, in most cases, to survive uh, the damage of additional storms. We saw that last year in southwest Louisiana. Uh, and so I encourage homeowners to take advantage of the program, uh, and, and I also uh, want to make sure they understand it has to render the home habitable, Meaning if you've got extensive damage to your home and simply fixing the roof isn't going to allow you to live in the home, you're not going to be eligible for it. It's at no cost, uh, so nobody should ever say, hey, you owe us money uh, for that blue roof that, that was put on or, or have you pay in advance or anything like that. Uh, that's not going to happen. And finally, it is not contingent upon whether or not you have homeowner's insurance. Uh, so we encourage people to participate in the program uh, and and. I might, to get back to your original question, have additional concerns. Uh, I don't at the moment because I know that those assessments uh, do continue. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I've been told that there are, what, there, there are damages in Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, so damage assessments uh, started on, on federal and non-federal uh, flood protection systems, whether they were levees, uh, locks, gates, you, you, you name it, um, really from starting last Monday uh, when we went to see whether any of them breached. Uh, and in fact, uh, at this point, we don't believe any of these uh, acts suffered a breach. There was some minor overtopping, and the overtopping can sometimes uh, cause damage that has to be repaired. Um, but but we, we are not seeing extensive damage to our flood protection systems. There is damage to the Bubba Gate, uh, I'm sorry, the Bubba Dove floodgate in Terrebonne Parish. And oddly enough, that gate was designed for storm surge coming in from the Gulf being the primary force that would operate against it. Uh, the, the storm came in on the east side of the floodgate, so what it primarily got was the wind as it turned and came out of the north uh, because of the way the hurricane winds circulate. And the storm surge actually acted on the gate from the opposite direction and, and revealed a, a, a deficiency in the engineering and design of the gate, which is going to be remedied. I had this conversation with Parish President Gordy Dove. Um, and in addition to that, they know they have to be able to get that water out faster so that less force works against the gate. So they're going to put in more pipes to allow the water to go out um, as well so that all of that isn't directed against the gate. And those repairs are going to happen uh, relatively soon. Uh, and, and I know that uh, President Dove understands how important this is because you never know when that next hurricane's coming. Uh, to get you more information on that system, I should have had Chip here today. He is not here, and so he's the, the one person that I can't look over here and call on. But I, I will ask him to come to the next press conference and talk more about whatever damage we might be seeing across the entire system, federal and, and non-federal. Yes, sir. Okay. first thing that led to the evacuation on the 31st was the first uh, post post landfall message that we received probably around six o'clock uh, uh, on that morning now as I had said before right now the the a very deliberative investigation is now going to be looking at all of the 911 calls that you mentioned and whatnot that were pre landfall and we will put just as much effort uh, into that section of time as we did for the post landfall time. Uh, uh, the first one we had that came in, my records are showing is uh, Monday, August 30th. Uh, yes, it was water intrusion. We had uh, gotten word that approximately eight inches of water had infiltrated at least one or two buildings on that site. And so that's what swung us into action. Well, no, water intrusion is definitely a health concern. I mean, you, you need to look into mitigation efforts. You need to look in to make sure that people's health and welfare is taken care of. What are they gonna do with those individuals? So, so no, that, that, that is what put us on our radar and it was a health concern. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so those of you with questions for Mr. Russo, and, and uh, would please go ahead and just uh, call on him while, while he's up here, please. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Yeah, once 
once again, that is where the focus is now going to shift. What I can tell you is, is there's nothing per se non-compliant or illegal about moving that large number of folks to a site, as long as that site has food, water, linens, the basic necessities, and basically the minimum necessary components to provide for the health and safety and welfare of those residents. Uh, what the revocation letter letters that came out today focus on is the fact that regardless of the plan, the folks were there, did you in fact meet your requirements to care for the health, safety, welfare of those folks, and did you put them first? In the back. LDH was kicked off. The, well, first of all, yeah, there was there was basically the surveyor was out there. My understanding is and and the narrative will bear it out uh, in the revocation letters is uh, surveyor had completed a tour. Of course, that's when we knew that the situation had deteriorated. We wanted to continue our investigation, begin taking interviews with the folks, uh, trying to begin to assess. At that time, my understanding is, is that a site manager and or nursing home administrator came up and informed our surveyor that Mr. Dean was on the phone and insisted on talking to, to the surveyor. That at that time is when the surveyor uh, informed uh, us that Mr. Dean informed her to get off of his property. We went back, uh, it was reported to the sur uh, it was reported back to state office, and then a, a team was basically spooled up and sent back out the very next day because we knew at that stage we needed to get in there and uh, commence rescue efforts. Well, like I had said, we went in Monday, we looked at the facility, we saw that, that, that conditions were going down, you know, deteriorating, uh, set it back up again as prudent folks would do, go back out Tuesday, that's when we determined that the facility was definitely deteriorating, wanted to continue assessing the folks, and that is when we were informed that we needed to vacate the premises. I'll also point out that throughout post landfall, what you're going to see in the narrative uh, and what uh, the facts I believe will bear out is that we were getting conflicting uh, messages. Uh, you know, uh, we were getting uh, text messages from the owner uh, saying that they had a plan in place and everything was fine. And that is not what we were finding when we were on the ground. So by that Tuesday late, as we were told to exit the property, we knew we had to get in there and we responded uh, immediately. And I believe those rescue efforts were heroic. Uh, I will have to check on that for you. I don't know offhand. Yes, in the back. <laughs> I, I think I've already stated that with the revocation letters. I believe when you look at the narrative that we have so far, you look at the text messages that were sent, you look at the surveyor reports, uh, I don't think anyone could reasonably reach a different conclusion that uh, the standard of care for those residents who are our most fragile residents was not met. But I'm certainly not going to litigate the case here, that's for sure. Okay, any additional questions for me? Yes, sir. How many have been delayed and rescheduled? Yes. Uh, is Joe Kenner hiding out, hiding out there? You'll be here. I don't know if you got an answer to that. 
Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. I, I think the question was how, how many second doses were delayed. Is that, I couldn't hear the whole question. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell you an exact number, but I, I can tell you that, listen, we, we advise people to get the second dose if it's Pfizer or Moderna on the recommended day. It's 21 days for, for Pfizer, 28 days for Moderna. If you can't make that because of a hurricane or because of a life event or for any reason, it is absolutely okay to get that second dose days later or even weeks later. Absolutely okay. And you do not need to restart the whole series. So for anyone that did delay or not be able to get to their second dose appointment, that's okay. Just get it rescheduled and get it done as soon as possible. Okay. Okay, one or two more. Yes, ma'am. I have not. So we did. We did have a meeting earlier this afternoon. Uh, he was uh, expressing his concerns about a number of things, ranging from the postal service to contacting commissioners to. Uh, employees of, of registrar of voters offices uh, meeting deadlines with respect to new registrations uh, coming in uh, so that they could be put into the system so that those individuals could vote in the upcoming election um, to just a number of things related to the election machines themselves and the conditions of polling places and so forth um, he did make a recommendation that we uh, postpone the election basically by a month so that the general election date becomes a primary election date and that we would have a date uh, in uh, December that would serve as the general, the new general election date. I did not make uh, a decision. I, I needed to, to uh, uh, look at some legislation and some other things, and, and, and I'm not going to announce a decision here, but obviously one is going to be forthcoming soon because we have to uh, take action one way or the other uh, very soon because, because either either you go forward with the election is scheduled and the deadlines kick in literally right away or all those deadlines get pushed back by a month. And so I understand I don't have much time uh, to make that decision. Uh, and I do appreciate the Secretary of State and his team coming over uh, and expressing uh, those concerns. Um, so a lot of it has to do with electricity being out in, in, in these, especially in these parishes where we, we're not sure if it's gonna be back in time for early voting and, and so forth. Uh, and the displaced populations. And we were talking about nursing homes a moment ago. There's a number of things that the Secretary of State's office and registrars do with respect to nursing homes um, that, that may still be evacuated. So all of that would, would certainly make it very difficult. And I have to determine whether it's, it really makes it impossible and, 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 and uh, should cause us to shift the date. Uh, but you'll get an answer on that soon. And maybe that was it. Look, thank you all very much uh, for your continued coverage. Um, we, didn't, we didn't talk thus far so much about post-storm safety. Um, it's obvious when you say that the newest death, one of the two was an individual who fell off of his roof. Um, please be careful out there. Uh, whether you're operating a chainsaw, you're fixing your roof, you're, you're doing anything. It's, it's hot, uh, you gotta stay hydrated, you gotta cool off, you gotta pace yourself. Uh, and, and if you can, uh, wait. Uh, wait until you can get some help. And, and make sure that, that you are checking on your neighbors and your older family members and anybody uh, who lives in close proximity to you that might have special needs. Generator safety remains critically important with all of these folks across this, uh, southeast Louisiana who, even as today, don't have electricity. Uh, make sure that you're operating those in a ventilated area uh, and, and not close to your house and, and, and so forth. Uh, let, let's be very, very safety conscious so that, so that we don't see the confirmed death total with respect to those deaths related to Hurricane Ida continue to increase. Uh, let's be good neighbors to, to one another. Uh, I know that it, this is very difficult. We do see steady progress being made every day, uh, but if it's not being made in a way that you and your household is be benefited, then, then I understand that, that it's not uh, that relevant to you. Um, but, but the electricity uh, is being restored every day. More and more gas stations are having more and more gas. 
Uh, the water systems are coming back online. Boil water advisories are being lifted. I believe we lifted the one for East Jefferson today, which will take a huge number of, of uh, houses and put them back into full service with water. And that number is going to continue uh, to get better as well. But we know we have an awful lot of work to do. We know that everybody uh, doesn't have their electricity back. We know that everybody can't go to a gas station in their community and gas up. Uh, we know that there are tremendous challenges around nutrition and so forth, and you're just going to see the response continue to grow and ramp up every single day, uh, and things are going to get better until at some point we are fully recovered. That is not going to happen uh, for quite some time. But one of the reasons I wanted to bring my team today is so they could share more detailed information with you. You have a better idea of all the forms of assistance that are available, which ones might really be helpful to you and your family, and you also now know how to access those forms of assistance. And we will be announcing more and more efforts uh, as time goes by. So let's continue to work hard. Uh, let's, let's be good neighbors and let's lift one another up in prayer. And I can assure you we're gonna get through this and we're gonna work hard every single day uh, until we do. Thank you all and God bless.